Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the legislature, the thumbnail sketch that the clerk read is about all that really needs to be said to bring us up to where we are. No amendments were adopted yesterday. The speaker withdrew his motion to bracket the bill, so now what we're looking at is a bill which would abolish the death penalty. It would then replace it with a life sentence without possibility of parole and require the individual who is convicted and sentenced to that term to provide restitution to the family, to the estate of the person who had been the victim. And that's about all I think, Mr. President, that I need to say to bring us up to speed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chambers. We'll move to the amendment. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, Senator Flood would move to amend with AM 307. Senator Flood, you're recognized to open on Amendment 307. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I think it's important for me to give a, a few introductory comments before we start talking about what this amendment does. Uh, this amendment, in my opinion, although I am opposed to the underlying LB 476, goes a long way, I think, for county attorneys and prosecutors in the justice system in reducing the excess due process that exists in our current capital murder statute uh, if we're going to change that to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I want to be very clear, I want this amendment adopted, but it does not mean I'm going to vote for the bill. Uh, I assure you I will not vote for LB 476, but I guess I'm doing this because if, if the policy of the legislature uh, in Nebraska will be that we do not have the death penalty, I do not see any reason for the extra super due process that we've built into our statute since the mid-70s following the decision in Furman, Gregg, uh, Ring versus Arizona, uh, LB1 in 2002, the moratorium discussion and changes in 1999. Um, I don't see any reason to have that extra language in the statute. So I realize that this amendment does take us off a little bit the, the true discussion of whether the death penalty is the right um, right uh, sanction in Nebraska, whether we want the death penalty, I believe we should have the death penalty. This amendment simply goes into Senator Chambers' bill and strikes certain provisions so that if it, that is the case and you really are voting for LB 476 to reduce the cost of the state, then we should not have all of the extra super due process that, have been, that has been built into our statute. Specifically, what am I talking about? Well, and, and I will spend some time later today discussing some of the, the, the implications of the super due process that's been built in over time. But basically, this amendment strikes uh, those provisions that I talked to you about that were added after Furman and Ring. And I can go on a section-by-section -section summary to give you an idea of what this does. In Section 1, it strikes Section 29, 25, 20 in its entirety, and those are the procedures for aggravation hearings, to find aggravators. So, in my opinion, we don't need aggravators if we're simply going to, and I don't want to diminish the, the substance of such a sentence, but if, if we're going to sentence the offender to life in prison without the possibility of parole, it, it, I don't see any reason under the case law that we need to find aggravators and have mitigator hearings. Uh, similarly, it strikes the section where the three-judge panel uh, has a process for receiving evidence on mitigators and sentence successiveness or disproportionality. I don't know that there has to be a proportionality analysis uh, under a system where we have life in prison without the possibility of parole. Uh, it also strikes Section 292522, uh, which is the three-judge panel weighing aggravators versus mitigators, uh, the statutory aggravator mitigators in 2523. Uh, this, is, this amendment in Section 2, uh, with regard to Section 28303, the first-degree murder statute, strikes the language in LB 476 requiring the three-judge panel process with weighing of aggravators, mitigators, uh, and, and goes forward. Uh, what else does this do? Well, this bill in Section 6 um, and 7 strikes additional language regarding the three-judge panel. Section 8 is a continuation of, of the same. Section 9 adds 29.1602 to the repealer section, and Section 10 adds 29.2261 to the repealer section. So basically, we're taking out a lot of the language in LB 476 that has been built in over time, contemplating a first-degree murder sentence, including the death penalty. Uh, where have we come? Uh, I guess it's important to talk about where, and I can use this uh, amendment also as an opportunity to talk about 
all of the due process provisions that have been built into the death penalty um, uh, first degree murder statutes over time. Uh, what did Nebraska do after that Greg versus Georgia case? Well, as you might remember from yesterday, in the mid 70s, we already had a bifurcated uh, sentencing uh, process uh, where essentially, if you were convicted by a jury, the jury would decide whether you received a jail term or uh, the death penalty. If you were convicted uh, during a bench trial or after a plea to the court of guilty, uh, you were sentenced by the judge. Uh, Obviously, after Greg, we found that finding of aggravators mitigators was appropriate, as well as an automatic repeal and the requirement that the sentence of death be supported by written findings of fact. Now, I think that's important to note. If somebody in Nebraska is convicted of the death penalty, their sentence is automatically appealed to the Nebraska Supreme Court, and it is reviewed thoroughly. Um, and I think that those are the types of super due process provisions that don't need to exist anymore if the policy of the legislature is to switch to a system of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. After Greg, uh, the legislature added the proportionality excessiveness review by the Supreme Court on appeal. Uh, after Ring versus Arizona, which is a 2002 U.S. Supreme Court decision, uh, the Arizona capital sentencing scheme, let me just talk to you about it. This is the, these are the facts that gave rise to the decision in Ring versus Arizona. After a jury found the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, the trial judge would weigh the aggravators and mitigators and decide whether the death penalty was appropriate. Um, the Ring case essentially said that uh, a defendant uh, can be sentenced to death only after certain facts, aggravators, are found by a court. Such facts can simply, uh, cannot simply be characterized as sentencing enhancements as they function as elements of a capital offense. I guess what I'm... Uh, pointing to here is that after Ring, Nebraska had a problem similar to Arizona uh, where a judge or a three-judge panel was charged with finding aggregators, not the jury. So after Ring, the legislature said, well, it's the jury's job to determine whether the aggravators exist. Um, and so we made a number of changes in LB1. Again, super due process provisions that were built into our statutes uh, in 2002. LB1, Section 4, required that witnesses in capital cases be endorsed by 30 days before trial. Section 5 required the information filed by the prosecutor to include notice of aggregators, and that information of the pleading could be amended, but not later than 30 days before trial. Section 10, the findings sections, clarifies that these post-ring cases were procedural in nature only uh, and not... Uh, to be considered substantive to run into trouble with ex post facto concerns. Section 11 and 12 of LB1 in 2002 changed the process relating to the aggravator hearing and hearing relating to mitigators, sentence excessiveness or disproportionality. Uh, the new procedures adopted in LB1 were much more detailed. Uh, the Nebraska rules of evidence according to the law would apply at an aggravator hearing. A jury's verdict on the existence of aggravators must be unanimous, three judge panel, uh, that would be convened to hear evidence regarding mitigators and sentence excessiveness or disproportionality. Uh, we'll also hear evidence regarding aggravators if uh, the jury uh, did not. Any probative evidence admissible uh, regarding uh, mitigators and sentence excessiveness would, would be done so without the uh, rules of evidence and, and, and under the Nebraska rules of evidence. I guess what I'm saying here is we have, over time, built into our system a number of protections to make sure that we comply not only with federal law, with state law, but more importantly, that we make sure that someone sentenced to death in Nebraska has the appropriate super due process to ensure that Nebraska does not go down this road lightly. And my question to you is, if we're going to repeal the death penalty in Nebraska, doesn't it make sense? in advance of whether or not that is done on LB-476 that we adopt LB or uh, AM-307 so that we can build in the, the uh, cost effectiveness that some of you have, have relied upon. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't base my decision on the death penalty on the costs involved. I think certain crimes warrant and certain behaviors warrant the death penalty, uh, but, but that's where this amendment takes us. And in my next opportunity to speak, I'm going to talk to you about some of the effects that LB1 had on one cases minute. in Madison County. 
uh, you'll find that certain admissions were made uh, inside that 30-day window. I want to talk about mental retardation and the clarity necessary uh, in some of that language. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, how, how thorough this set of statutes are, these statutes are with regard to, in, to securing the death penalty against an offender. Uh, so I guess I am looking forward to taking AM 307 to a vote. I think it's a reasonable question to ask in advance of the uh, discussion on the underlying bill itself, and I look forward to a continuing discussion. I also want to compliment the legislature on its um, uh, attention and um, acknowledgement of the gravity of this situation as I think we've had a very good debate to this point and I don't want to see that disturbed. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Flood. You've heard let me, let me acknowledge Senator uh, Flood's comments about the, the debate. Obviously, it was fabulous. I mean, we were here yesterday and we debated a great issue. We didn't have to be called out to the lobby. And, and that's why we are a great body, and I appreciate the comments Senator Flood made. I'm going to accept this amendment. I think, I think uh, it's, it's, an, it's an appropriate amendment. Uh, my argument and the reason that I have, and, I, and by the way, I, I, I'm speaking only for myself, not for the other members of the Judiciary Committee, because this amendment was not offered at that time, but I appreciate the uh, spirit in which it was offered. I, I, I'm sorry Speaker Flood can't vote for the bill with the amendment attached, because I think it is a good amendment, and we should have the opportunity to, to discuss it. And the amendment may need some work between general file and select file, but I think it gets right to the point. In, in 1988, when this matter came before the legislature, when I was here, I didn't vote to repeal the death penalty because I felt, I was certainly felt strongly that there were a few cases where the death penalty needed to be carried out. Since that time, it has not happened. And you're, I'm going to be handed out, handing out to you uh, information about uh, the many, many, many cases that have occurred in that time span where the crimes were just awful, awful crimes where the death penalty was not, uh, was not the punishment. And, I, and I'd, I'd ask you to take a look at those, because if anybody can, can compare those in any rational way with the cases that are on death row, I'll... I'll eat my chair. So that's number one. Number two, I certainly don't feel any safer uh, with the death penalty the way it's being uh, applied in Nebraska than I did 10 or 12 years ago uh, when it was the representation made by many was that we're going to reduce crime and, and the death penalty is the panacea. And thirdly, quite frankly, being tough on crime does not necessarily mean being for the death penalty. I'm, I'm now becoming convinced of that. And I I, we can, one can be tough on crime if one has a criminal justice system that works, that's efficient, and that punishes people for the crime. And I think that's what Senator Flood is getting at. If someone has been convicted of first-degree murder and has committed a crime that is just simply awful under any standard of morality that we could possibly apply, then they should serve the rest of their lives in prison. They should not have the opportunity to live the lives that, that others live. They have given up that right. And, and though I, I can't speak for my other members of the committee, we didn't have a chance to look at this amendment in the committee, I, I, I think I can support it. And I certainly am not speaking for, for Senator Chambers or, or anyone else. And, and I think it will be interesting to hear the debate about it. But it's getting right at it. If the issue, I think Speaker Flood mentioned yesterday, what we really need to do is examine the criminal justice system as a whole. I agree, because those who run around the state saying we're tough on crime because we have a death penalty are simply ignoring the facts. The facts do not support that conclusion. It is simply rhetoric to run around and get, and, and, in my view, and I've come to this conclusion after looking at the facts in the committee and, and quite frankly over the last several years, and all of us have lived, in the, lived out in society, we haven't lived in a box, we know what's happened. We know, that, we know in reality that crime has gone up. We know in reality that the death penalty has not impacted crime. We know that. We know that. So let's, let's look seriously at Speaker Flood's amendment. Let's incarcerate people with certainty. One minute. Let's incarcerate people with certainty. Let's have a punishment that is certain, that is effective, and that's efficient. 
and to simply run around and say, I'm for the death penalty, therefore we are, I am tough on crime, just doesn't sell anymore. It's way too simplistic, and it doesn't reflect reality under any stretch of the facts. It does not, does not, it is a non sequitur. It, it, it absolutely it, it is not supportable with the facts. So I'm going to support this amendment for now. Listen to the debate. Listen to what Senator Chambers and other members of the Judiciary Committee and other members have to say about it. But I think we're getting to it. Let's have a tough penalty for those who violate the law. It, in the, to this degree, let's make it certain, let's make it effective, and let's do it and start reducing crime in the state because it has not gone down. Period. We're going to be the question at Senator Chambers' request here in a few minutes, and so I'd like some time to work on my amendment, but I would, I would give Senator Chambers the opportunity to have the rest of my time. Senator Chambers. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the legislature, this is an amendment which does have some plausibility. I have not had the opportunity to evaluate it, so I had asked Senator Flood, would he break his amendment into maybe three major parts so that we can look at those chunks, discuss them individually, digest them, and see whether or not they do fit in with abolishing the death penalty. Here is what we have to keep in mind. Even when the death penalty no longer exists, there has to be something to distinguish a murder which carries a straight life sentence from one which carries a life sentence without the possibility of parole. While there is a death penalty, the courts have said, the U.S. Supreme Court, that all murders are bad. That has to be kept in mind. But when you talk about administering a punishment that takes a person's life, then you must discuss this issue analytically, in great detail, and with great care. So the ordinary murder cannot carry a death penalty under rulings by the, Nebraska, the U.S. Supreme Court. An ordinary murder, which does not have aggravating circumstances, cannot carry the death penalty. If a court imposed a death sentence on an ordinary murder, it would be struck down by the state's Supreme Court, and if that court did not do it, the U.S. Supreme Court would strike it down. This is why the emphasis by the courts has been that the aggravating circumstances must be established beyond a reasonable doubt, and the jury must make that determination. So. Every murder is bad, but when you're talking about categorizing punishments, you have to have something to distinguish the murder which carries a life sentence from the one that carries death. When we replace the death penalty with a life without parole sentence, there must be something articulable, as the court might say some objective basis to the extent you can make anything objective in this area to show that this murder carrying life without parole is somehow more aggravated, more serious, worthy of the highest punishment that the state can give as opposed to a straight life sentence. So I'm willing to look at what Senator Flood is presenting to us, but I don't want to leave the sentencer with no direction or guidance whatsoever. That would put us back to where we were before the court came down with its Furman decision in 1972, which struck down all death penalty laws because the one who announced the sentence had no guidance or direction whatsoever in handing down that sentence. In the Furman case, a plurality of the judges had said, that you have got to limit the discretion with some objective standards so that it is One clear. Minute. You are looking at the specific crime. Then you are looking at the particular perpetrator, the sin of the sentencer. You must guide that discretion, circumstances of that perpetrator, and then 
you must add those aggravators to show that this murder indeed was different from the run-of-the-mill or routine murder. So when Senator Flood finishes his division, we can then take each of those divisions and go into the detail necessary to understand just what it is that's being presented and why. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Mr. President and members of the legislature, I, I've enjoyed or I have learned a lot from the discussion yesterday and took some, some notes on, on what generally the debate was. And, and I concur with the, the speaker and, and others about the discussion that we've had uh, to date and, and uh, hopefully that we will continue the same level of, of caliber of the discussion. I think from the response that I heard or at least the, the statement early this morning from Senator Ashford, it, it is a emotional issue. Uh, there's a lot of passion. Uh, there's a lot of passion for the law and I think that's what we saw from, from Senator Ashford and, and his perspective. I'd like to go back just briefly though and, and touch base on some of the things that I heard yesterday and, and provide some additional information. Uh, I don't believe it, it undermines or, or reduces the arguments that were made, but I do think that there needs to be some, some further clarification. Generally, we, we centered around yesterday a, a, a few key areas, and, and one of the things that, that I heard yesterday, and before I get into that, uh, I understand that, that the Speaker and, and Senator Chambers and others are working on dividing this, and, and uh, I will try to uh, generally confine my remarks to, to this subject and that we discussed yesterday as opposed to discussing the amendment before us as the actual motion before us may change here uh, in the near future. The issues that was brought up was, was the cost. Uh, the cost of, of carrying out a sentence of, of death or the cost of prosecuting an individual under statutes under the death penalty. One of the examples that was given was North Carolina. Uh, the comment that was made was that it, it has been stated that it costs approximately $2 million more uh, to prosecute an individual under the sentence of, of death or a, a death penalty case uh, than it does for life without parole or, or a life sentence. If you actually go and read the North Carolina study, and I haven't read all of it, I'm, I'm in the process of looking through the Duke study that was actually done in 1993, and again, for a point of information, recognize that the 93 timeline predates the 2002 Ring decision and the change that we have made in, in our existing law that was done in the special session. And so while we're not comparing apples to apples, if, if that was the, the benchmark or the point in time when we we're going to refer to, then I think it's appropriate to analyze what that study actually said. There's a statement, and I believe this is generally referred to in, in uh, some circles that oppose the death penalty, that it approximately costs $2.16 million for the average cost of the execution for all death penalty cases. The way that you arrive at that number is that if you had 10 individuals that potentially were all going to seek or be um, in front of the court on, on uh, charges pending them for a death penalty case, if you compile all of those into one total cost, only one person is executed, then you can get to $2.6 million per case or, or per individual because only one person was actually executed and therefore the total cost is borne by that one individual. That's fuzzy math. In fact, if you actually read the study and if you go in and look at, at the study, it further it's some key points from the other side of the equation, and that's the life sentence prov provision. It only assumes a 20-year provision. It doesn't assume life without parole. And so if you're going to include that, you have to add another $69,000 a year on top of that to truly get to a true life sentence. So to compare apples and apples, you have to add between $500,000 and $750,000 per prisoner to get to a true life sentence. In fact, if you read the statement in the executive summary of that report, uh, it, it has a couple key provisions. And again, there are supporting information on one side, and then there's, there's supporting information on the other side. I think you'll find that true in the study that was done in Nebraska in, in 99 through 2002 that there are things that will support some sides and things that will support other sides, and depending upon where you fall on the debate on, on the death penalty, you may or may not agree with that and, and may or may not choose to use that on the floor. But the prison costs that were assumed in the Duke study from 1993, the North Carolina study, uh, is that it approximately saved the Department of Corrections $166,000 if an individual was sentenced to death and executed after 10 years compared to an individual who was paroled after 20. And logically, you can argue that people in Nebraska have been on death row longer than that. The cost of pursuing the death penalty was $163,000 more. So it actually didn't cost any more. 
those are the types of things in the study. It is true that it, it may cost more because of the, the prosecutorial proceedings. But you have to also weigh in the other total cost of incarceration, which at times are left out of some of these studies. So I've appreciated the discussion, and candidly, I'm learning a lot. As a non-attorney, as someone that, that has looked into this issue and has had legislation in this area in the past, uh, I'm willing to learn. And I think that's appropriate for this process is to educate one another and to sharpen our discussions to understand what the true facts are. Uh, but I do think that in the context of this, that additional information probably does need to be provided. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, members of the legislature. Uh, much like uh, Senator Peterson noted yesterday, when, when I came to the legislature myself, I thought I was in favor of the death penalty. Actually, the day I was sworn in for this job, newspaper reporter asked me my views on the death penalty. I thought, well, i got to take some positions on some heavy-duty issues. And, and uh, my kind of knee-jerk, simple-minded uh, response without any really uh, deep-down deliberations on my my behalf, I said I was in favor of the death penalty. Which, you know, I really didn't. I, I'm trying to navigate through this, and I'm so appreciative of the of the depth and the reach of the debate yesterday. Really helped someone like me, who is trying to navigate through this through this process, through this thought process, and through this issue, and. I owe a lot of gratitude to the members of this legislature for enlightening me yesterday. It was, as Senator Stutman said, um, I've been here five years. I never witnessed uh, a, a, a debate of the nature that we had here yesterday. And I, as one that's kind of navigating through this, I'm much appreciative of that, actually. And drawing from that debate yesterday I, and, and all the stuff I've been reading on the issue, I really do think that we have the death penalty namely and primarily for retributive reasons. And I think we couch those retributive reasons in the justice terminology. I think Senator Ashford kind of spoke to that being tough, and, 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 and we kind of couch retributive uh, things, and we embed them in, I think, justice terms, in our thirst for justice in some of these sensational crimes. I think primarily we have the death penalty for the victim's families in an effort to make them whole. But at the same time, I think our criminal justice system does not do a very good job in all areas, in, in, in other areas of criminal justice administration. I mean, you have simple assaults, misdemeanor level, felony level, you have thefts, theft by deception or actual physical thefts, you have white collar crime. I worked in the criminal justice system for 13 years. We do a very poor job from a criminal justice perspective of making victims whole on those level of crimes. So why would we think, why would we think can do a good job in terms of victim wholeness in capital murder cases? I think Senator Lathrop's speech really targeted in on the uh, unequal distrib distribution or unequal assessment relative to the death penalty as a se sentence. I think if you, if you take that, if you note that, and note generally speaking, the criminal justice system does not do, it's really not a reservoir to make victims whole. It's a reservoir for punishment, and it's a reservoir for rehabilitation of offenders. It's not necessarily a place where victims find wholeness. Unfortunately, it's not. So I don't see where we can extend our thinking within the criminal justice system to capital murder cases that we don't do very well, quite frankly, on lower level offenses. Also along the lines of Senator Peterson's thinking yesterday, and it's a, it's a part of, uh, of my religion's social teaching uh, on this issue, that now that we One have minute. the ability in, in our modern society, now that we have the ability to deliver non-lethal means or methods to keep society safe, there really is no demonstrated need for the death penalty. My religion speaks to the death penalty as, as, as not being intrinsically evil in and of itself, but now that we have methods 
available to us in modern society that keeps and preserves society and keeps society and members of our community safe, there is no demonstrated need for the, for the death penalty. I know what's coming. We have this amendment. I wish we could give LB 476 an up and down vote, then have the proponents and opponents work together before we get to select file, rather than trying to do this on the floor. I wish we could have a vote on LB 476 if it advances, and then we, we don't have to do all this stuff on the floor. I wish we could just go to a vote on the bill, Time, maintain the fidelity, then the proponents and opponents can work together in the meantime. Thank you. Mr. President, <clears throat> members of the legislature, uh, I believe that this is perhaps the most somber and uh, maybe the most difficult speech I have ever made. I've appreciated <clears throat> but not enjoyed the debate yesterday and today on LB 476, Senator Chambers' bill to abolish the death penalty in Nebraska. The legislative process is one of debate, <coughs> negotiation, and compromise, and I'm attempting that today. I have several questions. Senator Erdman alluded to uh, one of those this morning, as he shared. Yesterday, Senator Lathrop said it would save money to pass LB 476. I'd like some solid evidence to support that statement. A statement was made that there are men who may have deserved the death penalty, but are now out on the street. Where's the evidence, and why did this happen? Senator Flood said yesterday that in 1976, a twofold purpose was stated for the death penalty. First, retribution for the victim. Secondly, a deterrent for would-be criminals. I would say it could be argued that the Bible, God's word, is against retribution. Jesus said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I'd also argue that because of the great time lapse between conviction and execution, it's not a deterrent. That's probably a fault of our justice system, which many times favors the criminal instead of the victim. I believe quick execution would serve as a deterrent. And think with me that once we give up the option of the death penalty, it will be gone forever. Statement was also made that there are people walking around in prison that have committed worse crimes than those on death row. How can this be? I can't help but feel that this is an undermining of the justice system. Just to prove it isn't fair to all, evenly administered, so let's throw away the procedure, the process. How does LB 476 address the horrid problem of people walking around in prison that have committed worse crimes than those on death row. How does LB 476 fix that? I also heard statements made yesterday about uh, what do those who vote for us think? This is a personal, moral, ethical issue with me as I believe it is to all of you. And our voters' preference has nothing, absolutely no place in this debate and this vote. Senator Chambers indicated the penalty isn't applied uniformly because some county prosecutors don't believe in the death penalty, so won't apply it. These prosecutors are to follow the law, not interject their personal beliefs. And if they can't do that, they should resign. Cruel, unusual punishment, electrocution. This is interesting. We're concerned about cruel and unusual punishment on someone who has forced much worse cruel and unusual punishment on the victim. Why do we even care? 
And I believe it's because we're focusing on a very important principle, the value of human life. LB 476 goes to great lengths to protect and extend the lives of the lowest of human beings. Those who have committed the most heinous crimes on, for the most part, defenseless victims. They are guilty people, not innocent. Senator Chambers has shown a genuine concern for these lives and considers them to have considerable value. Time, Senator. Thank you. Ouch. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the legislature. Um, I refrained from speaking yesterday because I've uh, just out of deference for those who have put in a lot more time than me on this. Um, so I thank Senator Chambers and Senator Flood. Um, I am going to speak today, but I uh, would like to yield. I will do that later. I would like to yield the rest of my time to Senator Carlson, if I would, if I could. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Fulton. Senator Chambers is hopeful we will become a more civilized and orderly society. He's also concerned about humane treatment. I could hear it clearly in his description of how the straps were applied to John Jubert. I heard the passion when he talked last week about fair and humane treatment of animals, and I respect him for it. He operates by principles, is passionate about it, and I'm certain he'll keep his word in regard to it. If it's correct to be concerned about the rights of and lives of the lowest of the lowest, it has got to be even more right to be concerned about protecting the lives of the defenseless and innocent of our society, the unborn. Our family has the greatest, most beautiful twin grandchildren who are 21 months old. They love their grandpa and grandma. And those of you who have experienced that know what I'm talking about. There's nothing like it. They needed protection, however, because they weren't full term and were born at eight months. They got along beautifully and have filled our family with love and joy. They were born at the same age that our much flawed laws allow for partial birth abortion. In that barbaric process, very much alive children are ripped limb from limb from the womb. Sharp objects pierce the brain to kill. Legal capital punishment in our civilized society. The U.S. Supreme Court says all murder is bad. As I've said, Senator Chambers, you're a principled man of your word. If you support me next year on an anti-abortion bill, I will gladly turn my testimony to positive for LB 476. I'll speak out for it. I will vote for it. And I believe God will be pleased with both you and me. That will demonstrate consistent testimony. I will move to bring pro-life in the abolishment of the death penalty to match my pro-life stance for the unborn, which I will never compromise. Then we would be in agreement. People who allow abortion at the start of life should also be consistent and stand for capital punishment after the worst of crimes. That's consistency. I thank you for listening. I invite you to join me in opposing capital punishment at both ends of the spectrum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. I stand in support of the amendment and of the bill. Senator Ashford a bit ago almost was pounding the pulpit saying the system is not working. I wanted to jump up and shout amen. And then I remembered I'm a Methodist, not a Baptist, and I can't do that. But he is right on target. The system is not working. And one of the gaps that we have is the whole thought about deterrence. I, I welcome the number of comments about it. When we're doing a statistical review of deterrence, we forget that some time has passed. You can't compare deterrence from 1900 to the present day. They, not, they do not compare. 
on the frontier, which I have studied pretty carefully and can tell you some hilarious events of hangings. Some of them are really humorous. On the frontier, hanging had a deterrent effect. They didn't very often hang somebody for uh, killing somebody, but they sure hung them for uh, stealing a horse. And it had a great deterrent effect. But now we have put a time element in there that has destroyed that deterrent effect, or very nearly destroyed it. It has greatly compromised it. I remember talking with some uh, young men in my neighborhood who had a friend for a thug. He's 20 years old, and he's out there to kill people. He doesn't expect to live to 25. Is he bothered by the death sentence? Not a bit. Think about it from his point of view. He's, uh, he goes out and kills this person in a heinous way. He's guaranteed to live for another 20 years. He gets an extra 15 years for killing somebody when he adds on to his own imagination. And the uh, speaker's comments about the aggravator factors uh, plugs into this. The aggravator factor, there is bias here.